As we continue our intentional living sermon series, we turn today to the direct teachings of Jesus. He taught often about the kingdom of heaven. This particular parable teaches kingdom citizens about our responsibility to serve as faithful stewards of kingdom resources as we wait for Christ's return. Will you pray with me as we prepare our hearts to receive God's word today? O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Quiet our minds and open our hearts to receive your word today so that we might grow in stewardship to intentionally care for and grow your kingdom well. Teach us to seek your purpose for the resources you have entrusted to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Richard's Complete Bible Dictionary defines kingdom as a ruler's sphere of authority over the hearts and lives of his subjects. And it continues, theologically, the universe could be seen as God's kingdom under his sovereign authority. But the Old Testament prophets predicted a future kingdom which God would set up on earth. While the New Testament maintains that sense of expectation, it adds the idea that God's kingdom is present wherever and whenever people acknowledge his, him as king. So as we dig into this passage this morning, there are a couple of understandings that will help us. First, recognize that the people Jesus is directly teaching would have known that prophecy of the Old Testament. They would hear Jesus' words from a pre-developed expectation that the Messiah would set up a political, geographically located kingdom. So just prior to telling this parable, Jesus predicts his death and his return, teaching them to shift that understanding slightly. Yes, that physical kingdom will be set up, but not this time. In this coming, the people needed to come to a spiritual and personal understanding of God's kingdom that exists wherever and whenever kingdom citizens or disciples acknowledge his authority. We are the kingdom of God. Allow me to clarify as sort of a side note here. Matthew uses the phrase kingdom of heaven. Uh, through, but, but throughout the Gospels, kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven are both used. Um, Richard's Bible Dictionary reads, Most see Matthew's use of kingdom of heaven as a reflection of the tendency in, Ju in Judaism to avoid the direct use of the name of God. So these are simply synonymous names for the same kingdom. God's kingdom in heaven and on earth. Secondly, we need to understand that the term talent may be applied to any gift or resource given by God. The people in Jesus' day would have understand this, understood this as a sum of money equivalent to about $1,000. That would have been a lot for them. However, Jesus was not living and ministering among wealthy people. Many of his followers were very poor. They didn't have $1,000 or $2,000 or $10,000. How are they to relate such a parable if they don't have that kind of money to be invested? So I don't think it's by accident that the term talent refers today to a skill or an ability. Jesus is speaking here of any resources God has given us that may be used for the sake of his kingdom. James 1.17 reads, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Every good gift you have comes from God. Your finances, your home, your vehicles, your time, your resources of self, all are from God, and they are expected, according to this parable, to be invested to build up the kingdom and as proof of your faith. As kingdom citizens, our faith compels us to use our resources to grow the kingdom. 
In verses 19 to 23, the Lord speaks to the first two servants. And it didn't matter that one servant returned 10, th 10 talents and the other only four talents. The Lord says to both of them, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful in a, a few things. I will make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of your Lord. They both passed this test by simply offering a return on their Lord's investment in them. Here the Believer's Bible Commentary reads, The test of their service was not how much they earned, but how hard they tried. Each used his ability fully and earned 100%. These represent true believers whose reward is to enjoy the blessings of the Messianic Kingdom. <coughs> this parable, when misunderstood, might lead a person to believe that salvation is based on works. At the end, those who invested their talents were welcomed into the joy of their Lord, while the lazy servant was cast into the outer darkness. Here the Believer's Bible Commentary reads, It was not his failure to invest the talent that condemned him. Rather, his lack of good works showed that he lacked saving faith. You might recall that in part two of our series, we discussed our God-given purpose to work and that our faith is reflected in our works. And last week, we spoke of the three parts of faith, the head, the heart, and the will, and that faith is known, accepted, and lived. This third servant did not have faith in his Lord. He feared the Lord, but not in the loving, reverent sense. The third servant was terrified as reflected also in his words. Upon the Lord's return, the servant accuses the Lord of being a hard man who reaps what has, he has not sown. Kind of sounds like he's accusing his Lord of being a thief. And he uses these fears to excuse his inaction with the talent he was given. He protected it and returned it as it was, but that didn't fit with what he claims to know about his master. He, his claims give him even more reason to have put that money to work. He could have at least earned interest on it, but he didn't. So his words condemn him rather than excuse him. The idea here of investing his talent to at least earn interest is worth a deeper look. The Believer's Bible Commentary reads, The mention of bankers in verse 27 suggests that if we cannot use our possessions for the Lord, we should turn them over to others who can. We have to be careful here, though. Writing a check to other ministries to do kingdom work on our behalf must not be our only effort. We have far more resources to steward, including our time, our prayers, our ability to love and encourage others. These things cannot be stewarded for us. Reverend Arthur T. Pearson, in a brief work entitled Our Lord's Teaching About Money, wrote, the Lord's exchangers can show him how to get gain for the master. The church partly exists that the strength of one member may help the weakness of another and that by cooperation of all, the power of the least and weakest may be increased. We, as a church, are, in a sense, the bank Jesus refers to here. When a person desires to seek Christ, to grow as a disciple, where do they go? To the church. When a person has resources they don't know how to use for God's glory, where can they go? To the church. We ought to be able to help one another put all our resources to work for the Lord. The bottom line is that God has invested in you. He supplies you with good gifts to use for his glory. You've probably invested some funds in some way, perhaps to set aside for your retirement. Were you ever at all nervous about finding the right investor? Maybe you didn't have a choice. Perhaps your, uh, your employer invested those in their own agency. Personally, I would not want to be that investor. That just seems really complicated 
and a huge risk. You have to follow the trends and really understand the market, how it works, so that you don't lose all the money someone has invested and entrusted to your care. Can you imagine being responsible for billions of invested dollars for a big company's pension plan? That has to grow and thrive from one investor to the next for generations, or you might lose the livelihood of thousands of people. Stewarding God's resources is similar in that our failure might cost an unknown number of souls the gift of eternal joy. God's investment must continue from generation to generation. The good news is we don't need to get overwhelmed trying to figure out how to steward God's resources to get the right return on God's investment in us. God will take care of that if we simply try. Paul wrote in 1 Timothy, verse 17, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Yes, your resources, your talents, your time is all for you to enjoy in this life. And the greatest enjoyment is in using our gifts for God's purposes. Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Proverbs 19, 21. There are many things you can do with your time, your talents, your finances, all of your resources. Remember to seek the Lord's purpose for them all. Amen. So let us now commit our resources.